Good morning. Let me begin by, again, expressing uh, my appreciation to Cooper as well as Scott, uh, the school here, for the tremendous privilege and the opportunity to be here this weekend to share in our global uh, Christian week. Um, as I mentioned early on in the week, uh, this is actually quite a challenge for me because I do not speak in English very often. And I feel I'm just getting my English tongue untwisted, and the week is almost finished. <laughs> and so I will need it retwisted for this weekend. Uh, I'll be speaking at a, a Chinese church here in the Chicago area uh, in their mission conference, and then returning back to, to my family, uh, who lives in, in Taiwan, and uh, returning back to ministry in, in Asia as well as in China. But it's been a joy for me to be here, and I... Uh, pray that the Lord would continue to uh, grant this school uh, a global vision. Uh, the challenges that we face are immense, and yet I think as we serve the Lord together, uh, we're confident that he will equip us, enabling his church in this, the last days, to fulfill the great uh, commission. Uh, this morning, I would like to uh, use as the title of my message, Four Days that transformed missions. Four days that transformed missions. Actually, if you have read any history of missions, you will surely know that over the course of these 200 plus years in modern missions, uh, certain events uh, have happened that were very instrumental, very significant, uh, very earth-shattering in terms of of missions and the church's involvement in missions. My thought goes back to William Carey's article with regard to an inquiry into how Christians should use any means possible to bring about the conversion uh, of the heathen. It was a booklet that was published in 1792 that uh, missiologists have told us uh, was very, very significant in terms of presenting the challenges of, of missions uh, to, to the then known world. Here in the United States, if you're familiar with mission history, here the Haystack prayer meeting that took place in Massachusetts was very, very significant in bringing about a beginning to missions uh, here in the United States probably closer to my own heart or to my own situation, obviously was Hudson Taylor's uh, beginning of the China Inland Mission that took place in 1865. And just about two years from now, we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of the founding of the China Inland Mission. That was also, I think, not only significant for China, but uh, inasmuch it was a faith mission, it was always also very, very significant in the development uh, of faith mission. Certainly, will, uh, the, the Cambridge Seven, uh, the, that group of seven people who went from Cambridge to China was very, very significant in bringing about an awareness of missions among college and university students. And actually, uh, the equivalent here in the United States, the Mount Hermon Hundred, uh, were very instrumental in starting what we call the student volunteer movement that, again, was very, very significant in revolutionizing missions from the standpoint of college and university graduate participation. And the list can go on and on of different significant events in mission history that were earth-shattering, that were formative, that were, in fact, very transformational. Now this morning what I'd like to do is actually go back into the book of Acts and think together with you on an event that I believe was probably in many ways the most significant and the most transformational uh, when we think of missions today. And the event that I'm referring to is actually the event that is found uh, here recorded in the book of Acts not only in the verses that we just read in chapter 11, but you'll know if you're familiar with this passage that uh, this event, that is Peter's visit to Cornelius' house, actually begins in chapter 10. Just from a uh, survey point of view, in terms of the significance of this event, 
Obviously, Luke in the Gospel of Acts records for us many, many different events that took place in the early church. And yet I think if we were to do a comparison, if we were to do a close study, it would seem to me that this event actually was very, very significant. If nothing else, if we were to just look at the amount of space and attention that Luke gives to covering this event, it begins obviously, as I mentioned, in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, but the description of this event actually goes right through to the 19th verse, or sorry, the 18th verse of chapter 11. In all, there are 66 verses, and of course, I realize that in the original language, there were not verses and chapters, so uh, this kind of division is a bit artificial, but nevertheless, there are 66 verses that Luke devotes to describing this one event, the Cornelius event, Peter going to Cornelius' house. And I believe that actually, if we look at Acts, there is not a second event that Luke takes as much space as he has taken in this event to describe something that took place uh, in the early church that was very, very significant. And of course, if we go back and look at this chapter, especially chapter 10, you will know that it actually covers four days. That's the title, Four Days That Transformed World Missions. If you look at chapter 10 from verse uh, 1 to verse 8, you remember that Luke describes for us that first day where an angel in a vision appears to Cornelius. And following that description from verse 9 to verse 22, uh, we enter into day 2 where Peter uh, has a vision also. And we're familiar with that vision of these unclean, from a Levitical point of view, animals brought down and a voice saying to Peter, take and eat. And of course, Peter, uh, seeing this vision or this picture three times, responds that these are unclean. I will not eat them. And then verse 23, just one single verse represents the third day in these fourth four days, describing Peter together with these six brothers that we just read about, uh, going together with those whom Cornelius had sent back to Caesarea. And then the remainder of chapter 10 describes for us uh, what takes place in Cornelius' house. Four days in all that were very, very significant, not only in Peter's life, but subsequently, as we see in verse in chapter 11, were very, very significant, in a sense, were earth-shattering for the New Testament church. Now, there are many themes that we can talk about in this chapter, but what I'd like to do is very quickly point out what I believe are four, at least, very significant themes uh, not only in terms of uh, a message that Luke wanted to communicate, but uh, I think we will very quickly see the application uh, even in missions in the 21st century. Uh, three things, just very quickly, that I want to share with you. First of all, as I read this chapter and I read this account, the first thing, obviously, that struck me was that there was a salvation that needed to be shared. There was a salvation that needed to be shared. Peter had to go to Cornelius' house to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that message of salvation. Now, actually, if we go back into this chapter and note Luke's description, it's very interesting because it would seem to me that Luke actually goes out of his way to describe the God-fearingness of Cornelius. For instance, if you have your Bibles, uh, go back into chapter 10 and, and notice some of the instances where very intentionally Luke is describing for us uh, Cornelius' if you want to call it religiosity uh, or to call it his devotion to God. For instance, look first at verse 2. Describing Cornelius, he and his all of his family were devout. A, a word that Luke uses to describe several different people, both in Acts as well as obviously in the Gospel of Luke. But not only they were they devout, but they were also God-fearing. We notice that Cornelius' religion, his faith, wasn't just something that was heavenly directed, but also it fleshed out into his life because he gave very generously to those in need as well as praying to God regularly. 
Actually, if you jump down to verse 4, you'll remember Cornelius seeing this vision, this angel, this messenger appear to him. Notice in verse 4 how even the angel affirms Cornelius' faith or his uh, devotion. The angel there in verse 4 answers to Cornelius and says to him, Your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. And then if we were to jump down to verse 22, you remember that these servants had been sent to Peter's house. And, and notice not only Luke's description of Cornelius, the angel's description of Cornelius, but even Cornelius's servant's description of Cornelius. There in verse 22, speaking to Peter, this, these men sent by Cornelius say to him, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. And notice their description of him. He is a righteous and a God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jews or all the Jewish people. Now, we won't take time. There are several other references in this chapter uh, really painting a, a rather uh, good picture. And I've often described this as actually being a person who would be more than qualified perhaps to be a deacon, an elder, and maybe even a, in a pastor in the church that you and I might serve in. I'm sure if we were to list out these qualifications and present them to an elder or a deacon board, uh, I am sure there would be an anonymous, uh, uh, unanimous agreement that here is a person that obviously we would want to serve on, on a church board. Yet it's very interesting, and again, referring back to the passage that we just read, that in spite of, despite uh, Cornelius' devotion to God and his prayer as well as his giving to the poor, it's very interesting that he still lacked a critical thing, and that was the message of Jesus Christ. And there in verse uh, 14 of chapter 11, uh, this is what was told to Cornelius by the angel, that he, that is Peter, will bring you a message through which you and all your household and then notice this phrase, will be what? Saved. And so in spite of all of what Cornelius was about, there was still this need for salvation. There was still this need for salvation. Now, I believe that that is very, very significant in the day and age that you and I live in. A day and age that has often been described as postmodernism. And within postmodernism, we obviously don't have the time to look in depth at it today. But basically, we live in a day and age in which the message that is given to us is it actually doesn't make much difference what you believe in because, after all, all roads lead to Rome. And that somehow the Creator God, whoever that God might be, that being might be, he has uh, given within every religion a, a certain degree of divine light that enables the adherers of that religion, the followers of that religion, to make their way to God. And today, as we look at the world we live in, we, we face a very, very critical challenge as a church, as a, a group of followers of Jesus Christ to once again affirm the, the, the certainty that Jesus actually is not a way, but rather he is the way. He is not a truth, but rather he is the truth. He is not a life, but rather he is the life. And today we are facing uh, an issue, a discussion, and perhaps in some instances, a debate on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, the superiority of Jesus Christ. And, and we can take much more time to flesh all of those out, but unfortunately we do not have time this morning. But it would seem to me, first and foremost, that this story reminds us of the importance, the necessity of sharing the message of salvation. And you can go back and look at this passage and see not only is there this emphasis on Cornelius needing to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but there is obviously also a great emphasis on Peter needing to go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to Cornelius and his family. 
You know, as I've studied this passage, I've often asked myself the question, wouldn't it have been just so much easier if the angel would have told Cornelius and his family about the gospel of Jesus Christ? It would have certainly cut out a lot of space in the book of Acts. It would have been so much easier, wouldn't it have been? And in, in a sense, that brings us into a mystery, and that is why God in his sovereignty has ordained us, full people full of weakness, to partner together with him in the work that he has called us to do, the accomplishment of the Great Commission. And I do not have an answer for that mystery. Except it's very clear within scripture that there is that invitation. And, and here Peter is called upon to go to Cornelius' house. To go to Caesarea. And to tell Cornelius and his family about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So first of all there is a salvation to be shared. There is a salvation to be shared. But there's a second theme in this passage that I think is also very pertinent to us. And relevant to us today as well. And I've entitled that a commission uh, to comply. A commission to comply. That there was a commission not only on Cornelius, but even more so on Peter that called for Peter's obedience. Called for Peter's obedience. There are two words in this chapter that seem to me that are very, very significant. And these two words come with two different contrasts. The first word is this word vision, and if you go back and read through this chapter, you'll see this word vision appear several times. For instance, and we won't read those verses, but let me just lay them out for you. There in verse 3, we have this word vision. In verse 17, again in chapter 10, this word vision. In 19, this word vision. And then even into chapter 11, verse 5, we have this word vision appear. Actually, uh, if you're interested, and I've always been very benefited by a study of vision in the New Testament, specifically vision as it relates to Paul. And actually in the book of Acts, four times Paul has a vision. First at his conversion, there in chapter 9. Then in chapter 16, a vision of correction there at Troas, not sending him to Asia. And I've often wondered, why didn't the Holy Spirit send him to Asia? Uh, there are a lot more people in Asia than there are uh, the other direction. But anyway, uh, there was that, that vision of correction. Then in verse, in chapter 19, chapter 18, there is a vision of courage in, in Corinth, where he has this vision and, and, and the Lord says to him, take courage. And of course, then at the very end in chapter 26, a, a vision of confession where he says to Agrippa that I have not been disobedient with the vision that was given to me. And so this word vision is actually a very interesting word right in the book of Acts itself. But coming back to this episode, it's very interesting because it would seem to me that intentionally Luke paints for us a contrast between how Cornelius responded to the vision that he saw and how Peter responded to the vision. And just from a point of observation, uh, I've often been struck by how Cornelius's obedience or his response was immediate. As soon as he saw that vision, he immediately sent his servants to Joppa to look for Peter. And yet, very interestingly, in contrast, and you would have thought uh, the immediate response would have come from Peter, but in fact it did not come from Peter. Uh, and in contrast, actually, Peter went through a series of, of three uh, times over that the Lord had to tell him to do something. Uh, incidentally, if you study the life of Peter, Peter has a lot of threes in his life. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Uh, if we go and contrast the, the synoptic gospels, well, including also the gospel of John, it seems like on three different occasions, uh, the Lord calls Peter, or at least the, the authors describe it in, in, a, in a significantly different way that it would seem that uh, Jesus' call to Peter to follow him didn't just come once, but uh, perhaps it came three times. Uh, of course, we're familiar with Peter's three denials, 
uh, there at the betrayal of Jesus. We're familiar, of course, with John chapter 21, where Jesus three times over uh, says to Peter or asks Peter the question, do you love me? I wonder if you've noticed, actually, that in the New Testament, we read three times over of Peter sleeping. Uh, And that's a comfort for any of you who have decided to sleep here this morning, because let me assure you, uh, if Peter could have fallen asleep on those three occasions, to fall asleep when Jamie Taylor is preaching is actually uh, nothing too special. You remember the first time he fell asleep was on the mountain of transfiguration. And if you could fall asleep then, man, you can fall asleep anywhere. The second time he fell asleep, you remember, was at, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus invites them to, to pray together with him. And yet Peter and the disciples uh, were sleepy and they fell asleep. Do you remember the third time we're told that Peter fell asleep? It's actually in the book of Acts. There in chapter 12, you remember James had been martyred. And Herod then arrested Peter and and was actually going to judge him and was going to kill him. And and Luke there in chapter 12 tells us an amazing story. And I believe that is the sweetest of sleeps. If, If you and I were to know this is our last day on earth, I wonder if we could fall asleep tonight. Uh, probably I would have a hard time sleeping. But there in chapter 12 of Acts, we're told that Peter fell asleep, knowing full well, at least from a human perspective, that he was going to die the next morning. But it's interesting, there's another three in Peter's life. Three times over, Peter says no to the Lord. And that's almost an oxymoron from my perspective. If, If he is Lord, then it's not an issue of no, is it not? You remember those three occasions where Peter says no? The first, obviously, when was Jesus there in Matthew chapter 16 speaks of the cross. And and immediately Peter takes Jesus aside and says, in no way, Lord, will this happen to you. And then the second time Peter says no to the Lord is actually in John chapter 13, where you remember Jesus, knowing that his time had come, uh, showed the full extent of his love to his disciples. And he, and he got up from the, the meal and he, and, he, and he washed his disciples' feet. And he, when he came to Peter's side to wash his feet, you remember that Peter immediately said, in no way, Lord, are you, I'm going to let you wash my feet. And of course, then Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you're not a part of me. And to which Peter immediately responds, well, wash me all over then. And then the third time is the passage that we are looking at. And as I observed that, uh, uh, something that Hudson Taylor said came back to me. He said a statement, very interestingly, in a letter that he wrote to the European church, to challenge the European church, and, and this was at the end of the 19th century. He says that today in the church there are many people who are more than willing to confess Jesus Christ as their Savior. And yet few are willing to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And then he made this statement. And it was simply this, that if Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. And so we see this contrast, Cornelius' immediate response to a vision, contrasted to to Peter, no, 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 three times over. But there's another word here that's very significant, that I believe is very intentional on behalf of Luke, the author, and that is this word, sent, or this word, sent. Actually, three different Greek words are used uh, throughout this episode or this narrative going right to the 18th verse of chapter 11. Three different Greek verbs are used to describe either Cornelius sending people to Joppa to find Peter or Peter being sent by God to go to Caesarea. 14 times over in these 66 verses, this word or these three different Greek words send appear. And I believe that that is very, very significant. And it would seem in this sin, there's another contrast that, at least in my mind, comes to the surface. 
We saw already first a contrast between Cornelius and Peter with regard to this vision. But I wonder if you've ever noticed where Cornelius had to find Peter. Do you remember where it was? Where did he send his servants to? Well, we're familiar with the chapter and we immediately respond by saying they were sent to Joppa. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, obviously you're very familiar with this place Joppa as well. And and I hope I'm not reading too much into the biblical story. But I cannot but wonder whether Luke was tongue-in-cheek here with Peter at Joppa facing a very monumental decision on whether he was going to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And an Old Testament prophet who actually received a commission to take the gospel to Nineveh, but yet decided that he would go to Joppa and and buy a, a, a boat ticket that would take him in the opposite direction from where God was calling him to go. Jonah of the Old Testament. I wonder if there is a mirror contrast here that here in this passage, actually, Peter was very much also facing a challenge of obedience. Whether he was going to go the way of Jonah of the Old Testament or whether he was going to be obedient to God's call in his life. Well, there's much more that we can say about that. Except it would seem to me that here we're told of a commission that needed to be complied. A commission that needed to be complied. A vision and a sending of Peter. Could I just pause there to share several thoughts with you with regard to this commission that needs to be complied. I was struck by the fact that when Peter left to go to Caesarea, he did not yet know what God was doing. He had no idea. He was entirely clueless as to what God was going to do at Caesarea. Nothing is told of Peter. And, and so he, he, he went almost in the dark. And I just but help, cannot help but wonder whether there is a wonderful truth and a reminder for us there that it is actually, brothers and sisters, as we go in obedience, that we grow in our understanding of God and his purposes. It is as we go that we grow. The Great Commission, go back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. We, of course, begin there in, chap- in verse 18 of that chapter, describing the Great Commission. Uh, a, a few verses that are very, very familiar to us. But I wonder if you've ever paused to read verse 16 and verse 17 that leads into the Great Commission. Verse 16 describes the disciples, those 11 going to the mountain that God, that Jesus had told them to go to. And and when they saw Jesus, they worshipped. And isn't it interesting how Matthew begins his book with worshipping Jesus in a manger and ends with worshipping Jesus on a mountain. But then I wonder if you've ever noticed verse 17. It's certainly not a way to write a script, at least from my perspective. Uh, we are actually in the process of putting together a script, not, not me, but we've hired a, script, a screenwriter, uh, a script writer, to actually write uh, a movie script on the life of Hudson Taylor. And, and we're hoping, we probably won't get it done by the 150th anniversary of the CIM in about two years' time, but probably the year after that, we're hoping to produce Uh, A movie somewhere on par with uh, Chariots of Fire. Perhaps some of you have seen that movie of Eric Little, that Scottish Olympian who actually went on to be a missionary in China. Uh, Somewhere on the par of Amazing Grace uh, that speaks of Wilberforce and and, and the work that he did in the deliverance of slavery and the the prohibition of slave trade. Uh, but, but if I was to write a script, I would not include verse 17 here as a climax that Matthew has brought us to. But do you remember what 17 says? Matthew tells us that as they worshipped, some, what? Doubted. Well, I've always wondered why Matthew didn't tell us who doubted. 
Uh, we just know that not just one person doubted. If it was just one, I would say probably for sure it was Peter, but maybe not. But that's not the way to finish a gospel. I mean, surely if you want to paint the disciples in a, in a positive picture, uh, you wouldn't have included that. You would have glossed over that flaw in their character. And the honesty of Scripture is a fresh reminder of the trustworthiness of Scripture, is it not? But then the Great Commission comes. And I'm just struck by the fact, brothers and sisters, my friends, that the Great Commission was given actually to imperfect people. Jesus did not wait until the disciples were perfect before he gave the Great Commission. And here Peter did not have a clue what Jesus was doing. And yet the challenge was given to him. And it was only as Peter went that he grew in his understanding. It was only as he stepped into Cornelius' house. It was only as he opened his mouth to stop to, to start to preach. It was only in the middle of his sermon, and I would have loved to hear the ending of Peter's sermon. The Holy Spirit <laughs> cut him off, and well, maybe the Holy Spirit needs to cut Jamie Taylor off this morning as well. It was as he went, that he grew in his understanding. And my friends, that will be our experience as well, I believe. It is only as we go that we will grow. And just maybe one other thought quickly, uh, an encouragement to me, and that is that even before Cornel Peter went to Cornelius' house, God was already at work in Cornelius' house and in his life. And so we don't go with a Messiah complex that we are the savior of the world. Before we go to the mission, before we go to Egypt, before we go to the Middle East, God is already at there, hard at work. And so we go as a partner together and to join in what he is already doing in those places. And may the Lord make us sensitive to what he is already doing in those places as well. And so there was a commission to comply. But very quickly and lastly, not only is salvation to share, a commission to comply, but there was a threshold to traverse. There was a threshold to traverse. Uh, we don't have time to think about it, but I can imagine the struggle that must have been in Peter's heart when he stepped into Cornelius' house. Notice what he says to them at the very onset of, of going into their house. It's quite an amazing thing. It's, it's not a way to win friends and influence people. Uh, he arrives uh, there, and you remember Peter in 25 of chapter 10 enters the house. Cornelius meets him and, and falls at reverence uh, in, at his feet. Of course, Peter says, get up, stand up. I am only a man. Peter then goes into the house and finds a large group of people gathered. And, and notice what he says. He says to them, you are well aware that it is against our law uh, that a Jew... Uh, for a Jew to associate with or even visit a Gentile. And so I can about imagine the, the struggle, uh, the immense struggle that Peter must have faced uh, in stepping into that Gentile's home. And, and of course, the message of this whole narrative is how the Lord wanted the Jewish people, the Jewish Christians, to see the importance, the necessity of cross-cultural missions. That the gospel of Jesus Christ wasn't only for the Jews, but it was also for the Gentiles. And, and I wish that we could have more time to talk about this because I believe that this cross-cultural is not really only just cross-ethnic. It is also cross-social. It is also cross-generational. And there are a lot of crosses that the church today, not, uh, not the cross that Jesus was hung on, uh, but we need to cross over a lot of barriers in order that the gospel of Jesus Christ might be shared with those whom Jesus desires, God desires to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't have time to talk about 
that in greater detail. Could I just ask you, though, to pray especially, and, and for Chinese in our midst, you'll forgive me for, for, uh, for sort of putting the spotlight on the Chinese church, and, and it might be also equivalent in other instances, but after 30 years of serving in the Chinese church, one of the cries of my heart is that the Chinese church would be awoken even more to cross-cultural missions. You know, the Chinese church is very good at reaching the Chinese. And perhaps that is a characteristic of an ethnic church. And I sometimes wonder the role of an ethnic church in the kingdom of God. And I realize that there are probably some some, uh, legitimacies to the ethnic church. But it would seem to me that one of the dangers of ethnic churches is they they become very ethnocentric. And so even though Chinese here in North America live among Caucasians or non-Chinese, even though they work among uh, Caucasians or non-Chinese, because they go to an ethnic church, they do not invite these people to church and they have no other church to invite them to. And I'm doing a great service, a disservice to this topic by just sort of touching on it and then leaving it. Except to ask for your prayers. That, I, that the Lord would in the 21st century open the Chinese church's heart and mind and understanding to, to the, the centrality, the importance of cross-cultural missionary service. Well, let me very quickly, and I realize my time is just about over. Let me quickly just outline several other hurdles, thresholds that the church, I believe, needs also to traverse. In addition to cross-cultural work, it would seem that, secondly, the church today needs a clear understanding of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other ends of the world. As I have traveled over and over, I have heard the statement, well, we have even finished here in Jerusalem. How can we go to Judea? How can we go to Samaria? How can we go to the other ends of the world? That We have to first finish the work here in, in Chicagoland, or, or we need to first finish the work here in, in North America before we can go elsewhere. And of course, it would seem to me that there is no biblical grounding for that kind of dichotomy. That somehow we have to finish Jerusalem first before we can move outward. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken from an exegetical point of view, Acts 1.8 does not tell us to first finish Jerusalem, then do Judea, then do Samaria, then do the ends of the world. But rather to do it all together at once. And so I believe that that is a threshold that we need to step over. I think of the whole challenge of moving from purse to people as another threshold that the church needs to step over. And so often we have used the purse to to sort of soothe our conscience and say, Lord, well, at least I gave you my purse when actually God does not want our purse. He wants our people. And the challenge of sending people to missions We've highlighted the challenge of the threshold of the proximity of missions already actually in this week. And, and for the, at the risk of just being redundant, let me just say again, the mission field is not out there somewhere. The mission field, because of migration, actually begins on our very doorstep. I was sharing with Cooper yesterday evening of speaking in a church in Los Angeles, a Chinese church. I rejoiced with them at a vision that they had for the Japanese in Japan. And then I asked them, well, are you doing anything amongst the Japanese here in Los Angeles? Oh, and lo- oh, oh, only to be told, well, no, we're going to send the missionaries to Japan. And, and that to me is an unfathomable thing because if the Lord has given you a vision for a ja- the Japanese, a burden for the Japanese, it doesn't begin when you get on a, an airplane. Hudson Taylor said getting on a boat doesn't make a missionary out of anybody. And so the proximity of missions is a great challenge. We've highlighted the fact of the profile of a missionary is another threshold that we need to step over. That in bygone days, yes, the clergy were viewed as the missionary, the traditional missionary, and yet we live in a world today where 
More and more Christians need to be mobilized to use their professions as a platform to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. The entire Muslim world will not be won by traditional missionaries. It will only be won by mobilizing, equipping, and sending Christians via their professions that in and alone will give them a platform, a visa, a credential in the country that they are serving. And we need to awaken to the challenge of that. I think of another threshold of short-term and long-term a balance. And again, we live in a, a day and age where, where short-term and long-term are, are, we've sort of gone to the other side of the pendulum, haven't we? Hudson Taylor took 153 days to get to the mission field. If you go back and read mission literature of that day, this word short-term does not even appear. And yet I want to tell you that there are many places, including the entire Muslim world, will not be won via short-term missions. Until we go and learn their language and earn their trust and gain their trust, we will not reach the Muslim world. And so long-term missions is a tremendous challenge. I think of another threshold, and sorry, I'm throwing all of these at you guys all at once at the very end of my message. But I think of the plan of missions. And so often our strategy and mission is more of a conversion-based strategy rather than a discipleship-based strategy. We want to know about how many people you dunked in the bathtub. And yet we're called to make disciples of nations. But very quickly and lastly, it would seem to me another threshold is how to move from partisanship to partnership. How to move from partisanship to partnership. How we can work even more together in the great co-mission to the fulfillment of Jesus' command to make disciples of all nations. Well, a threshold to traverse or thresholds to traverse. Four days that transformed missions. And I believe at, from the bottom of my heart, brothers and sisters, that it speaks not only of Peter's day and the New Testament church day, but it also speaks to your day and my day. May the Lord indeed help us and may he transform each and every one of us toward the fulfillment of the great commission of Jesus Christ. Amen.